Welcome to the exercise class. Um, today we're going to do several things. So uh, there are going to be three exercises in this week's exercise sheet. If you could already see them on Moodle. So the first, the first one has to do with uh, changing the state of the qubit using the, um, the protocol that Ralph described in the lecture when you have to use like a lot of qubits from a heat bath with a different energy gaps. Um, then the second one has to do with the uh, Lindbladian uh, equation and Lindbladian evolution. And we're going to derive that equation here in class. And finally, the third one is uh, more about like how, um, how we can use these master equations and what they tell us about um, the, the states that we get between two systems and whether like we can, for example, harvest some entanglement out of uh, using a thermal machine. So first, uh, I'll just briefly comment on this, uh, the first exercise, which is about um, thermodynamic transformation of a qubit state. So the idea is that you initially have a qubit uh, with an energy gap, let's say delta, say zero, say one, qubit s, and it's initially in the state uh, rho s, which is uh, diagonal p zero zero plus one minus p one one and then you want to um, transform the state into the state rho s prime with the different populations say q zero zero plus one minus q one one okay and then there are several ways to do it, but we would like to find one um, which would allow us to optimize work uh, um, extracted. So one idea to how to transform the first state to another, given that we have qubits with various energy gaps, uh, Say this can be delta, this can be delta plus some epsilon, this is delta plus two epsilon, and so on. And they're all at the temperature beta or inverse temperature beta. So one option is just to choose one qubit out of that thermal bath and do one single swap. Uh, for this, you need to choose a particular energy gap of the qubit uh, that you want to swap with, given that uh, all of them are the temperature beta. Uh, and for that case, uh, so for example, yeah, you just need to find a qubit which already has the ground population uh, level as of Q. And from this you can find the energy gap. You can also calculate the work which is done in this process. And um, but this uh, but this work is often positive so you need to, to do work. Um, and it's not the optimal process because ideally we would also like to kind of do this process and also extract work. And indeed, the second option is to use all of these, like a certain number of qubits from the bath and just 
uh, perform a series of solves with, with our target qubit. So basically, what we do, we do um, n swaps. Uh, with the bath qubits uh, with energy gaps ranging from delta to the final uh, EB difference, which is the same difference as here. And the energy gap of the nth qubit would be delta one plus n epsilon, where epsilon would be increment based on, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, but uh, based on how many turns, uh, how many swaps we want to perform in total. So it's gonna be one over n if we want to make n swaps, e b minus delta, uh, over delta. We just make sure basically that um, each time the energy gap of the swap qubit is increased by um, f by epsilon. So is it correct? Should be eb. So let me just check. So eb equals delta one plus n epsilon is epsilon over e or minus one over n yes that's correct okay uh, and you already calculated in the lecture that uh, you can then lower bound the work by basically uh, the change in, in the free energy, delta F. So you just need to calculate delta E minus one over beta delta S just for the qubit uh, S, the target qubit. Uh, okay, and then you, by tweaking the number of swoops that you can do in this process, what you will see that for, um, for the values P and Q that are given in this exercise, uh, the, the work, which, would, the work which, done, which is done uh, in a single uh, qubit swap would be positive. So you need to uh, do some work uh, but here, um, the work would be negative, actually. Uh, and uh, so basically carrying out this many step process with n swaps would allow you to extract some work. Uh, I would advise you to use Mathematica to model that n swaps process and then also like play with the parameters um, P, Q, the energy gap, and the number of swoops. So in the exercise, you're given particular values of these uh, parameters, but feel free to play around and see what happens uh, in when we apply many stages of this protocol. Also, in the lecture notes, there are there are uh, plots, if you've seen, which are also produced by Mathematica, uh, which which show how, in in the limit of many swoops, you, one can reach the Landauer's limit. Um, so, if you're also interested, you're you can reproduce this, try to reproduce this plot in Mathematica. I think that's the best way to learn how the how this protocol goes. Basically, okay. Yes. Extract.
Um, yeah, in some sense, yes, because like for the second protocol, we indeed need this resource of um, of having basically um, yeah qubits with a particular energy gas, which are all kept at this temperature beta. So it's like you need more resource, so to say, to carry out that protocol. Yeah. Okay, so now let us go to the Limbladian evolution. So Limbladian evolution is a general way to write the evolution uh, of, of an open system. So basically we call the system open when uh, it's actually a big Hilbert space, and then um, the Hilbert space of the system is a small subspace of that big Hilbert space, and the rest is environment. And then in this big Hilbert space, we still have uh, some unitary evolution going on. Um, so let me just write it explicitly. So we have Hilbert space, which is consists of these two systems, and the second system, the environment, it's much bigger than the target system. And uh, this whole system still undergoes the unitary evolution. So one can still say, oh, that rho SE of T equals U SE of T. Uh, Rho S E of zero, U S E of T. But the problem is that uh, we don't want we perhaps we don't know the exact form of the Hamiltonian um, interaction Hamiltonian, or we we don't know what exactly happens in the environment, and we are only interested in the evolution of this target system S. And in that case, we can just say that <clears throat> mm, that we are only interested in evolution of the system S, which can be described by our TPCPM channel, which is basically the tracing out when we trace out the environment out of this big evolution. So in some sense, what we will be doing here is kind of first order approximation of how can I describe the evolution of the system S when it weakly interacts, sorry, this is dagger, uh, with the environment. Uh, we also assume here that the interaction, so that the environment evolves quite fast on its own. So basically all the, um, um, all the correlations um, which are accumulated with the system S at the previous steps um, are becoming negligible. And then uh, this is, as I said, is basically the TPCPM channel. So OS zero T. So TPCPM, uh, you probably already saw it in the, Q in the QIT courses, uh, trace preserve in completely positive map. This is um, a general way to, to describe a transformation which maps uh, density matrices to density matrices. Okay, uh, so let us first start with an easy thing. We're going to derive uh, a Schrodinger equation for mixed states. You probably, you probably already saw it in the OCM course, but let me just do it here as well because it also links then to uh, how we identify some terms in the Allen-Bladian equation that we will get. Okay, so now forget about 
the fact that we're only describing the partial evolution. Suppose that we again are talking about the system S, which undergoes the unitary evolution. Uh, so then, let's say that the system is described by the state um, rho, then, and the evolution is described by some unitary u of t, then the state of the system at the at the time rho of t plus delta t would be equal to um, u of delta t, rho of t, or u of delta t dagger. So I basically take the state at the time t, and I evolve it for some small increment of time delta t. Okay? Uh, then I can write this as in terms of Hamiltonian, so what I get is e to the power minus i h delta t rho of t e to the power i h delta t. Uh, so because I only interested in the first order with respect to delta t, uh, I I just write the first order um, approximation of this of this exponential. So I just expanded as series until um, delta t. So it's going to be identity minus i. Hmm. Okay, maybe for just for the sake of units, I'll just put the h bar there. But if I at some point forget to do it, please forgive me. I assume that h bar equals one. Okay, so we got i over h bar, h delta t plus uh, o of delta t squared. So these terms I'm going to neglect. Uh, rho of t, uh, identity plus i over h bar, h delta t also plus o of delta squared. Okay. I open up everything. What I get is rho of t. I only keep the terms which have delta t in the first order uh, because I, I'm not interested in the second order. So what I get is minus i over h, h bar sorry, h uh, delta t rho of t plus i over h bar h delta t. Um, sorry, forgot. Sorry, here is going to be rho of t here because the order matters. Um, and plus o of delta t squared. So this is going to be just a uh, h rho minus rho h. So it's, it will give us the uh, the commutator. So we will get rho of t minus i over h bar h rho delta t plus o delta t squared. Okay, now I divide now I put rho of t to this side, and I divide both sides by the small increment delta t, and I get my desired differential. So, delta t equals minus i over h bar h rho plus O delta T. This I don't care. Now I take the limit of delta T going to zero uh, and I get the differential. Okay. This is just when we consider the uh, the state which undergoes the unitary evolution, but instead of the um, 
the usual Schrodinger equation for pure states, we have one now for, uh, which also works for mixed states. Okay, uh, now let us do somewhat similar process for open systems. So for open systems, uh, we, we just said that the evolution can be described by this PPCPM map. So there I can write, okay, let me write first that. So for open system, Again, we take the state of the system at the time t plus delta t. And what this means, it means that we can use this map where we start at the state um, rho s of t. So here I'll talk all about the system s, right? Rho s of t, uh, and I evolve it using this TPCPM for a time delta t. Okay? And then I write that this is approximately, I can write it in a first order as rho s of t plus some increment delta rho, where this increment is much smaller than the initial state. Okay, uh, how can we write the TPCPM channel? We can always um, we can always describe the TPCPM channel in terms of its Krauss decomposition. That's what we're gonna do. So basically, what we have is we write this thing as the sum over k, a k rho of t, a k dagger, where a k uh, is the set of Krauss operators for this given channel. Uh, is everyone here? Uh, Familiar with the Krauss decomposition? Okay. Okay. Um, now, now using this Krauss operators, uh, we're gonna write this L LK operators that you've seen in the lecture today. So, basically, what I do, I take a zero operator. And I write it as identity plus delta t uh, L0 minus IK. Uh, and a k for all other k's which are non equal to zero, uh, I write as LK delta t. So um, I always can can do this uh, for, for any A0, AK operators. Also, the choice of which operator here is an, is an A0 operator is arbitrary. So it's just that I choose one which I represent in this way, and I choose all the others to be represented in this way. Uh, all Krauss operators are bounded. Moreover, the operator L0 and K um, are not only bounded, but also Hermitian. And uh, given the operator A0, I just choose L0 in K such that um, this, is, this condition is met. Okay, now we're gonna see how we can rewrite the equation then. Okay. 
So I know that now this choice of uh, represent, representing this operator seems to be a bit artificial, but we'll see how that allows to separate some terms which we already saw just for the normal unitary evolution uh, from the bunch of other terms. And we also see how this uh, anti-commutator arises, um, which was asked in the lecture. Okay, so first the A0 term is special. So we have A0 row A0 dagger. Uh, it's equal to so identity plus delta T L0 minus IK uh, row um, identity plus uh, delta T L0 plus IK. Okay, now we just open up again only until the first order of delta T as before. So what we get is rho, so here it's rho of T, that's what I mean. Uh, rho of T plus uh, so we're going to have delta T L0 minus IK rho of T plus delta T L0 plus IK uh, rho of T here and plus O of delta T squared. Okay. So what we get is rho of t plus um, we're going to have delta t L0 rho of t plus rho of t or L0. So we're going to have uh, delta t anti-commutator of L0 and rho. Uh, and for the IK, we're going to have minus delta T I K rho plus a delta T I rho K. So for that, we're just going to have the commutator. It's going to be rho K. Oops. Rho of T K. So rho of T plus this part. Okay. Now for the rest of the operators, given that representation, we can write that AK rho of T uh, AK dagger equals LK rho LK dagger delta T. So just remember that um, the only necessarily Hermitian operators are L0 and K. LK are not necessarily Hermitian because AKs are not necessarily Hermitian. Okay, uh, now we are ready to write uh, what we get as a result of applying this CPCPM. So uh, e of delta t rho of t, which we can also write as rho of t plus delta rho, would be equal to sum over all of these terms. Yes. Uh, ah, sorry, yes, it should be a square root here. Yeah, thank, thanks for the correction. Yeah, should be square root. Uh, let me check. Yeah, should be square root. Sorry, thanks a lot. 
Yeah, okay, so of course, yeah, square it because here we only want the first order term. Okay, uh, where was I? Yes, I was just writing the sum. So first we write this term, which we computed here. So rho of t plus delta t L zero rho t uh, plus I delta t this commutator rho of t k uh, plus O delta t squared plus this part. So this is going to be sum over k uh, from equal 1 to whatever how many there are. Lk rho Lk dagger delta t. Okay, so then we take, uh, then we do the same procedure. So we take the delta, the first order terms and delta t uh, together, uh, put rho of t on this side, and then what we get is uh, this, uh, we get delta rho equals delta t by something plus O of delta t squared. And then we divide everything by delta t and take the limit of delta t going to zero. So this is basically the same thing that we've done there for deriving this usual or Schrodinger equation from mixed states. And in the end, what we're going to get is the differential d rho by dt, which is going to give us uh, the following. So it's going to be yeah, L0 rho of t. Uh, minus, I'll explain the minus, I uh, K rho plus the sum from K equal 1 to how many there are. Okay, rho, okay, dagger. I know this is not yet the final form that we've seen in the lecture, but uh, we'll come there. So, one thing that we can um, kind of take away from the, the way of writing this is um, that let us just take take this and compare it to um, to that equation for um, for just usual unitary evolution of the mixed state. So there and here we have kind of the same term uh, rising up which is this, this commutator of, of a Hermitian operator with, with rho. So, and based on this, I can, I can say that, okay, this term, uh, I can actually attribute it to this, just this unitary evolution, and everything else is just the kind of additional terms that come up because the evolution that we consider is not unitary on the system S uh, individually. So, and based on this, I can just say, okay, I just choose K uh, as the Hamiltonian on system S over H bar. And then this term just becomes the usual term I over H, uh, HS row. Okay. Uh, now, final step is that we can actually um, express L0 in terms of all other um, Lindblad operators LK. And we do that based on a fact. Uh, we know that the trace, trace of the matrix is constant. So it's independent of time. So we're gonna solve the equation of that uh, the time derivative of the trace of the matrix is zero.
دیوار دیواری کی تریس آه تریس رو equal zero which is the same as saying that the trace of this equals zero. Okay. So we still have something else. Okay. So basically what we have to do is we take that equation and we calculate the trace. So what we get is um, minus i over h trace of the commutator of hs and rho plus trace of uh, L0 rho plus sum over k uh, trace of Lk rho Lk dagger. Okay, so what is the trace of the commutator? Yes, exactly because it's hs rho minus rho hs and the choice trace is cyclic. Okay, are you good? Um, so the trace of the anti-commutator? Yes, exactly. Again, due to the cyclicity of the trace. Um, okay, and here, this I can also massage due to the cyclicity. I will get trace LK dagger LK rho sum over K. Okay, so putting all these things together will be obtained. Ah, and this is zero due to this. Uh, I get two trace L zero rho uh, plus sum over k trace lk dagger lk rho equals zero, uh, which means that trace of um, l0, okay, so first, the first thing I'll do, I'll put this two away, and I put one half here, then I'll put everything on into one trace. Um, so what I get is trace of L0 plus one half uh, sum from k equal one. Yeah, I think maybe I'll put it here. Well, so we don't forget that L0 is not there. Uh, LK dagger LK rho equals zero. Um, okay, so we know that this this expression must hold for any row. So whichever row we input at, at any point of time, we input the row into this equation, this should hold. Because the trace of the matrix is always one, or the density matrix is always one. Which means that this expression uh, has to be zero. So L zero plus one half of the sum which means that L zero can be written as minus one half uh, sum of these L k's. Okay, so we got this conclusion and now we can input it into this equation to get the form that we usually see it in. So we're gonna get d rho by dt uh, 
minus i over h hs rho uh, minus one half now i'm inputting the l zero there so sum over k uh yeah not necessarily infinity just how many cross operators there are. okay okay uh row plus sum from k equal one okay row okay dagger yeah and this is the usual form of the Limbladian equation or master equation for um, for this for the for the evolution of the system as when we consider s an open system so for example um, what happens in the case can you tell me what happens in the case where um, the Hamiltonian of the system s an environment uh, don't doesn't contain any interaction between them what are the Lindblad operators then? Yes, they're all zeros because when uh, because when the when there is no interaction term in the Hamiltonian, um, the the system and the environment they evolve independently, which means that. Uh, when we take out the trace, when we trace out the environment, uh, we just get the this local unitary evolution on the system, and when we have when when the evolution is unitary, um, all these terms just disappear, and we are left with this usual uh, Schrodinger equation form. Okay. Okay. Let's make a break now. Uh, for five minutes and after the break I'm going to give an example of, of such an evolution which is more involved than just a unitary one and after that we'll talk about um, how we can extract entanglement from uh, thermal interactions. Let's continue. Um, so example, as I promised. So suppose that we are looking at the system, which is an open system, which is a qubit, so HS, um, yeah, qubit, dimension two. Uh, and we want to somehow have the process uh, which would, in the limit of uh, infinite time, allow for any initial state of the qubit to uh, to go just into the ground state. So basically, there will be some interaction with the environment happening as a result of which other qubit will eventually end up in the ground state. Uh, and that should hold for any for any initial state of the system. Uh, how can we describe this evolution? So I'm just I'm uh, going to give you already the uh, Limbladian operator. So, in fact, we will only need to define one operator for this. The operator L1, which we write as lambda, where lambda is some constant, uh, 0, 1. So, ah, also let us assume that the Hamiltonian of the qubit is 0 just for um, convenience. Okay, let us analyze why choosing this Lindbladian will indeed um, be sufficient to describe this type of evolution. So first, given this Lindbladian, we can already calculate the L0, uh, given the formula there. So it's gonna be minus one half uh, lambda, so it's going to be um, L1 dagger, which is, uh, and let us also assume for simplicity that lambda is a real number. Uh, so lambda 
one zero, lambda zero one. So it's going to be minus lambda squared over two, one one. Okay, let us write the Limblad equation in this case. So what we're going to have is d rho by dt. There's going to be no term corresponding to the Hamiltonian because we chose the Hamiltonian uh, zero for convenience. Uh, the second term will have minus lambda uh, squared over two anti-commutator of one, one, and rho. And the third term will be just lambda squared uh, L1 rho L1 dagger, which is 0, 1 rho 1, 0. OK. Uh, now let us assume that rho of t It is a two by two matrix because it's a qubit. And uh, assume that we have the following elements of this matrix, which depend on T. So it's A of T, B of T, C of T, and D of T. And of course, A of T plus D of T equals one, but uh, yeah, it doesn't matter that much now. Uh, okay, so using this, I'm just gonna input this form of the matrix in this equation. And then uh, basically for each of these elements of the matrix, we're gonna get a separate uh, differential equation. Uh, okay, so let us start calculating. I'll do it on a board. You can also already calculate forward if you would like. So first I calculate the commutator of one, one uh, and row. So this matrix A, B, C, D. So it's going to be um, first uh, just this multiplication plus this multiplication. So as a result of the first multiplication, I will get zero, so zero, zero, uh, C and D plus the result of second multiplication, I'll get zero B, zero D. So I'll get zero B, C, three D. Okay, uh, and then the second term, this term here, uh, we will have zero, one, row, one, zero. So here we have the row sandwiched between, uh, yeah, one and one, and then here we have zero, zero, so basically, the only term that will survive here would be this term, D, which will be then put into zero, zero um, element of the matrix. So basically this is just gonna be D zero, zero, zero. Okay. Uh, now we input this into the R equation. So D rho by DT would be equal to minus lambda squared over two, uh, zero B C through D, uh, plus lambda squared D zero, zero, zero. And what we get is lambda squared D, minus lambda squared over two B, uh, minus lambda squared over two C, 
uh, minus lambda squared d. Okay? Uh, and this is equal to d rho by dt, which means that this is equal to, uh, yeah, dA by dt, dB by dt, dC by dt, and dd by dt. And then we, we can solve each of these um, differential equations separately, uh, keeping in mind that we need to choose the constants such that at the limit of t going to infinity, uh, the final state would be the ground state. So only the upper diagonal coefficient should survive. And in that case, well, we'll see that for all of these elements, the solutions will be uh, some sort of exponentials plus uh, um, a constant. And the actual form of the solution with that boundary condition would be that the rho of t equals one minus d e to the power minus lambda squared t uh, b e to the power minus lambda squared over two t c e to the power minus lambda squared over two t and d e to the power minus lambda squared t. Okay, uh, and indeed in a in the limit of t going to infinity, uh, we'll only all these terms will die, die out, and we only le we'll be only left with the ground state term. Uh, so this is an example of um, how Lambladian operators look like for um, for this kind of evolution. If you ask me, like how, like given an arbitrary evolution, how do you find the Lambladian operators? There is no direct recipe. Um, I mean, for some for some evolutions, you just know which ones to choose. Uh, but for the most, it's um, it's still something you should find out mathematically. There is no there is no concrete recipe how to do it. Uh, okay. Is this more or less clear? How we derive this equation and how we can try to use it? Okay. Now let us go to the final part, which is how we can generate entanglement with a thermal machine. And there we're gonna use also the master equation um, for an open system. So while I'm wiping the board, I'll, quick, I'll briefly explain the setting. So the setting is there are two qubits. Um, both of them are connected to their individual um, heat baths. So they're the different temperatures. They have the same energy gap. Uh, and there is also uh, a weak interaction between these two qubits. Uh, which can be seen as these two qubits weakly uh, swapping. And then the interaction with the environment happens when these qubits connect uh, to the heat bath. So they interact with the heat bath. Uh, and that is a rare, but it's a very strong event. And this will be described by Helen Bladian, or rather by the, chat, by the part of Helen Bladian which uh, doesn't have to do with the interaction between two qubits directly. Uh, and then the idea is to see whether um, any meaningful entanglement can be still extracted out of the um, interaction between these two qubits. So even though they're weakly interacting and they're both connected to the heat bath, 
can we still use the fact that they have this weak interaction? Uh, so I have to warn you. So this problem will be based on a, on a paper. And some of the answers which are given to you in the exercise sheet and what, when, which I'm going to give you now are, uh, I'm not going to derive them. It's, uh, it will be quite a painful thing. Uh, but, and also the measure from the entanglement that they use in the paper, which is called concurrence. Uh, I was trying to find what was the physical meaning of concurrence. Uh, I failed. So it's just uh, w one possible measure for entanglement between two systems, uh, which we'll use, but uh, don't think it's the only one. Okay, so. Entanglement from thermal machine. So, as I said, two qubits. I label one as H, this one is hot, and the other one, label as C, is cold. Mm. Okay, so basically, yeah, the energy, the energy gap would be E for both qubits. And the first qubit is connected uh, to the bath with a temperature beta H. And the second qubit is connected to the bath with a temperature beta C. Uh, so first thing, so the individual Hamiltonians of, um, of these two systems, they can be written as just like one, one, so E one, one on the first system, let's label it H, uh, identity on the second plus E identity on the first one, one on the second. This is just summing up their individual Hamiltonians. Uh, they also interact, as I said. Um, and their interaction is quantified by this interaction or uh, coupling constant, uh, G. And the interaction is just the swap, basically. Uh, so it's going to be 0, 1. Okay, uh, this interaction is energy conserving with respect to these two systems. Because basically what this interaction does is if this one goes here, this one goes down here, and the other way around. Okay, and then there is this uh, interactions with the bath, which we treat as the interaction with the environment. And as I said, uh, here we just say, here we take on some, uh, this model where the thermalization is a rare but a strong event. And this, is, uh, this, this can be modeled uh, as so-called collision model. So, the collision model of thermalization is basically you just have particular time steps, and each at each time step k, um, sorry, at each time step, um, each qubit is either reset uh, back to its thermalized state um, or left unchanged. So with some probability. This basically means that. Um, we can write the master equation for the evolution of these two systems as so d rho by dt is minus i over h bar h zero plus h interaction. So here, just to recap, so we treat as an open system um, a joint system uh, which consists of these two qubits. So we write their full Hamiltonian. 
Uh, and plus, here we're going to write it in a bit of a different manner, not in terms of like Lindblad operators. So, um, just so. Um, BC of phi C of rho minus rho uh, plus BH phi H of rho minus rho. So I'll explain in a moment. So basically PC and PH correspond to the probabilities of the qubit C and H to thermalize namely to connect to their respective baths. Uh, what is phi C and phi H? So phi C of rho is basically after, what happens after uh, the cold qubit, qubit C thermalizes. Um, so first, what's left on the hot qubit is just a trace a partial trace of the total uh, total state where we trace out the cold qubit and the cold qubit has connected to its bath and now it's in a thermalized state. And the same here. So this is what happens if the hot qubit thermalizes. So the, cold, the state of the cold qubit is given by the partial trace and the state of the hot qubit is just the thermal state. Uh, okay. So, and the thermal states um, tau C and tau H, we'll write them as RK00 plus one minus RK one one. So we just input the notation for the populations. And tau H will be R. Uh, no, actually let me R C and R C and here R H and R H. Uh, okay, great. And of course, uh, the RC and RH, they relate to the energy gap and the, te and the temperatures of the bath. Uh, so now the question is, uh, can we extract any entanglement out of the, um, out of the joint state of these two qubits given that even though they weakly interact, there is still this event of uh, connecting to the bath, which as you see, they, um, they basically erase any type of correlation between two systems. But the, these events are probabilistic. Uh, by the way, this, uh, this master equation only works in, um, in the limit of uh, PC, PH, uh, G, sorry, PC, PH, uh, less than one, much, uh, much less than one, and the G much smaller than E. So this is perturbative, so-called perturbative regime. Um, so this basically encapsulates the statement that even though these uh, these events of connecting to the baths are very strong and erase correlations, they don't happen very often. The probability is very low. And also the coupling between two systems is um, as much less uh, energetic uh, kind of power or so than the the initial Hamiltonians of the system. Okay. 
how are we gonna solve this? Um, we're just gonna find the steady state solution of this equation. And, um, and then for that steady state solution, we're gonna analyze the entanglement of that state. When I say we're gonna find the steady state solution, it's more like, I'm gonna write it down now. It's also written down in the exercise sheet. And then you can, uh, you can at home take it and plug it in and check that it works. You're very welcome to use Mathematica. Please don't, uh, uh, yeah, please don't suffer yourself or uh, yeah, go through this process if that's too tedious for you. You're very welcome to use Mathematica in general, by the way. Um, so what is the steady state solution? So the steady state solution is the one uh, for which uh, d rho by dt equals zero. Um, so it's the one which doesn't change with time. Okay. Uh, and in this case, I'm writing it down. It's gonna be a process. So it's gonna be gamma dc dh tau c tensor product tau h plus two g squared over bc plus bh squared bc tau c uh, plus bh tau h tensor product the same thing Okay, and plus one more term, uh, G, D, C, D, H, R, C minus R, H over B, C plus P, H, Y, where first Y is I zero one one zero minus I one zero zero one and gamma there just in the front everything is one over two G squared plus PC PH. Okay. Uh, it's quite, looks quite imposing, but yeah, you can just input it and check it. That is indeed a um, steady state solution. Okay, now we have um, how the steady state looks like. Now we're gonna analyze the entanglement of the state. And for that, we're gonna use concurrence. So concurrence is one of the measures of entanglement, as I already said, and it's defined as following. A so concurrence um, so C of rho is the max defined as max out of two, so out of zero, or lambda one minus lambda two minus lambda three minus lambda four. And la these lambdas are eigenvalues Um, in the decreasing order of a Hermitian matrix R, which is square root out of square root of rho, uh, rho tilde square root of rho. It's not. It's not. It's not over yet. Um, where rho tilde is the following matrix. 
it's sigma y tensor product sigma y on just the conjugate of rho uh, sigma y tensor product sigma y, where sigma y is just the Pauli operator, the y operator. And here it's not the con it's not the conjugate transpose, it's just the conjugate. Okay. Uh, I left a link to the paper which introduced this interesting entanglement measure um, originally. Um, basically, um, I don't know how people came to define it that way particularly or which physical meaning it has, except for the meaning that it quantifies entanglement, that for sure if two states are not entangled, it's, uh, so two systems are not entangled, it's zero. If they're maximally entangled, it, um, it's one and so on. Uh, but other than that, I haven't really researched why it's exactly um, in this mathematical form. So if you're interested, feel free. Uh, okay, and the steady state concurrence can be written in the form, uh, which you can also in principle calculate using Mathematica. I think for this, like using your own hands will be a bit, a bit of a suicide. Okay. So I promise this is the last complicated thing I write today. Uh, so for this state, it can be written as the following so C of rho is going to be the maximum of zero. And the second thing will be gamma G B C B H over G C plus B H uh, R C minus R H uh, minus square root out of uh, H of R C R H H of one minus R C one minus R H where uh, H of R C R H would be equal to gamma B C B H R C R H plus two G squared B C R C plus B H R H over B C plus B H squared. And when it's H of one minus R C and one minus R H, just input in this formula instead of R C and R H, one minus R C and one minus R H, and you'll get the answer. Okay, and then one can uh, kind of analyze um, analyze two uh, two instances of this formula when the first when the temperatures of the cold bath and a hot bath are the same. So basically, the temperatures of both qubits are the same. And then another case, uh, and in that case, you of course have, for example, that R C equals R H. Um, 1 minus R C equals 1 minus R H. Uh, and if R C equals R H, so if the beta C equals beta H, means that R C equals R H, because this is the population of the ground level uh, of the thermal state in that case, uh, and they're equal. This means that the maximum of these two values is going to be zero. So basically, then the concurrence is zero and the state is not entangled. And you cannot extract any entanglement out of it. Uh, generate any entanglement. Uh, okay, another option. So this is, this is a bit of a useless case. Um, another option is to, it, is to see the case where um, the temperature of the cold bath is zero and the temperature of the hot bath is infinite. So, yeah. 
So T C zero and T is infinite. And then and then you get something. So So for here, we will have RC equal one and RH equal one half. And then basically you can input uh, them there and uh, find uh, an expression for that case. And then you can find the example of the coupling constant and the probabilities of uh, this thermalization events, PC and PH, such that this C of um, of the steady state, the concurrence of steady state would be non, non zero. And in that case, some entanglement is generated. Uh, yeah, this is, this is more or less everything about this exercise. So the main thing to take away from this exercise is just to kind of uh, get you acquainted with, with how the master equation can look like for the process, for, for such a process. Um, and basically when we have this rare but strong process of thermalization, we can always write it in this way. So for example, what, then you, um, what you can also wonder about, oh, um, what happens if only one qubit thermalizes and the other one doesn't? Uh, what if the interaction is somehow different not the swap, but other energy preserving interaction and so on. Uh, and then kind of the value of this interaction in this case is measured in terms of entanglement. It's measured in terms of entanglement, uh, which in this case is measured by concurrence. Um, okay, I think this is everything I wanted to say for today. Are there any questions? Okay, no questions, then thank you for listening. See you next week.